All right. Uh, <clears throat> so the, to the topic for today's lecture is um, the impact of industrial revolution and the age of historicism, the 19th century architecture. <clears throat> so um, 19th century is also sometimes known as the century of history. The 18th century pre prepared two things for the 19th century in terms of, um, you know, architectural development. One is top technology, that is uh, industri industrial revolution started in <clears throat> around the mid 18th century. Um, the second is the accumulation of knowledge, um, like the compilation of uh, encyclopedia, <clears throat> classification of knowledge. And uh, so knowledge acquired by empirical, empirical um, <clears throat> you know, uh, exploration of nature. So history <clears throat> is very important for 19th century. Uh, in fact, uh, Nietzsche um, called in the 19th century, <clears throat> quote, an excess of history seems to be an enemy to the life of a time. It has turned men to shades and abstractions. No one ventures to show a personality but masks himself as a man of culture. So Nietzsche was talking toward the end of the 19th century, uh, reacting to the, what he called the excess of history. Um, so <clears throat> which um, give us some idea about how you know history uh, was so uh, important for the 19th century uh, intellectual life, as well as um, the <clears throat> you know in terms of artistic creation. So um, let's first take a look at the um, industrial revolution. Industrial revolution. <clears throat> create new issues, new problems for architecture uh, in the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> the invention of steam engine, the, the uh, uh, creation of train, development of railroad um, <clears throat> made the previously long distance seems reachable. So there is a reduction of a regional difference. So the world became more flat. And uh, the second effect <clears throat> is the appearance of new building types. So there are some new building types um, <clears throat> never uh, constructed and never, um, never needed before, for example, <clears throat> the movement of people, long distance travel, create hotel, resort, uh, which uh, need to be constructed with greater, um, you know, scale to accommodate bigger uh, <clears throat> movement of people. And also uh, train station, that is also a new architectural type. So these new, architectural type without any precedence um, raise the question about style. You know, how are you going to build a hotel? How are you going to build a resort? How are you going to, uh, what style do you adopt to build a train station? <clears throat> so these are all new questions. And these new questions, um, draw people's attention to the very question about style. So previously, uh, building church, you know, there were 
you know, temples, religious architecture. Uh, there were previous examples. So the question is, what do you choose? Which one is valid? Which one best represent the value of the church or a specific school, specific sect of a church? But now it is totally new question. Um, the new building types, there wasn't any uh, previous examples. So <clears throat> the adoption of style based on what do you choose you know, to, to, to design? Um, uh, a train station in such and such style. So it also challenged <clears throat> the pre previous pre-existing concept about architecture. So for these new, new buildings, are they architecture? Are they just a utilitarian? Well, so what is architecture? So this new appearance of new things raise all kinds of question that is pointing to the very fundamental question <clears throat> about architecture and uh, about architectural um, design, uh, architectural style. So, um, so on one hand, it triggered discussion and thinking about architecture. On the other hand, there were new buildings that, that were constructed, uh, which is without much participation of architect. For example, factories. These factories, uh, in the early 19th century, for example, the, those in Manchester, um, the industrial, early industrial city in England, uh, <clears throat> or um, uh, Belper, um, industrial towns. So their buildings were constructed without any um, architect's participation. They were constructed by builders, by surveyors, and by um, engineers uh, who would not care about style at all. Their purpose was to build a building that is pretty much like building a machine, just like the machine inside. So these new buildings, like in this painting um, showing the um, McConnell's mill in Manchester without any decoration. And uh, for an architect, something like this wouldn't be considered as architecture. It's just a shelter, it's just a building. And they were constructed to accommodate a big machine. And those machine pretty much defined the form and space of architecture. Uh, the newly harnessed water power um, that use enormous uh, water, uh, enormous wheel, uh, <clears throat> which was moved by the flowing water and the motion of that wheel, uh, it's transferred to different floor through these very complicated <clears throat> levers, very complicated mechanism, transit that motion to rotate those gears and uh, for textile um, production. So <clears throat> these buildings, indeed, they were no more than a shelter for those machine. Those machine defined the character and the spatial features of these, these buildings. And they were without much involvement of architect in the traditional sense. And uh, nearby, um, so I highly recommend um, you drive to the city of uh, Lowell, uh, which is only like about an hour drive <clears throat> from Boston. So this is the early industrial town uh, in America, pretty much like those um, you know, industrial towns in England. Um, <clears throat> here, a entirely new town was created for industry, uh, not only the factories, but also the residential quarters, um, the organization, the headquarters uh, for um, the company were constructed here. So it's a, new, a whole new town was constructed, taking advantage of the water flowing in, in the river that give power to the factory, right? And uh, <clears throat> the rise of industrial 
town, factory town, um, created new social issue uh, for profit. Um, laborers were grouped together in large amount and their living condition was, was bad. So it created those social crises and these social crises initiate, uh, uh, led to um, democratization, uh, labor law and urban reform. Um, so new infrastructure of cities were, were constructed to solve these uh, problems. <clears throat> For example, the sewage system and they start to be systematically uh, planned and laid out for the <clears throat> for the new for for the uh, entire time. so um, it is part of the um, kind of a it is kind of the extension of the machine extension of the of the factory and uh, the problem of slums um, those urban slums in England and in America as well. So there was a social problem that um, requires architectural solution. <clears throat> so it is under such a um, background, a um, kind of a Gothic revival uh, was initiated because of those social crises, social problem created by um, the Industrial Revolution toward the mid 19th century, uh, some intellectuals, some, some people <clears throat> felt that the current social society, industrial society was, was not so good. Um, and uh, so um, after Renaissance, we know that there was a kind of a revival of the classical past fighting against the dominance of the church. And now toward the mid 19th century, there was a going back to the church, fighting against the ugly situation created by industrial revolution. Hu Jin was one of the early thinkers um, about, the, about industrialization. Um, he created um, images comparing the current, the current situation of urban life with the idealized um, Middle Age society. <clears throat> he gave his illustration long title called Contrasts or a, par a parallel between the noble edifice of the 14th and 15th century and the similar buildings of the present day. By present day, he means mid 19th century. So on the left, the one below is 1840, city in 1840. Um, buildings characterized though by those simplistic wall without much decoration, uh, very much like the, um, the factory buildings. And uh, the chimneys smoking, polluting the air. And then in the foreground, there is a um, kind of a prison, right? That panopticon prison. There's a central pavilion and all those surrounding area were under surveillance. Um, so the image is showing the oppressing uh, condition of the contemporary society of the 18, uh, 1840s. <clears throat> the image above representing the, a medieval town of the 14th and 15th century, just before or um, at the beginning of the, um, of the Renaissance, which shows churches, architecture um, decorated um, with sculptures. And those tall towers are um, the bell towers of the, of the church. Um, and those Gothic towers representing spirituality rather than the uh, smoke uh, emit, emitting um, chimneys. <clears throat> and on the right, he compare um, the residence for the poor. Um, so 
1840, it was the prison uh, for the poor. And uh, in, the, um, in the Middle Ages, um, 1440, um, it was those, um, you know, orphanage um, and the, all those church uh, welfares uh, for the poor and homeless. So he, you know, the, the past medieval pre-industrial society started to be uh, idealized, uh, started to be imagined as, some, as, the, as a kind of a lost paradise. <clears throat> so, um, Pujin started the Gothic revival. Uh, so since his ideal, he associated Gothic architecture with an idealized society, with a society not corrupted by uh, modernity, by um, the industrialization. Uh, and he actually converted to Catholicism. He didn't even want to go back to the reformed religion. Uh, in 1829, Catholicism was uh, emancipated <clears throat> in England. You know, in England before the 19th century was, you know, predominantly a reformed um, Christianity society. Uh, the, the English church, uh, Anglican, which is a reformed um, Christianity. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in 1829, Catholicism uh, was allowed. Uh, so Pujin converted to Catholicism and he designed, uh, he started to use those Gothic uh, <clears throat> detail to decorate uh, architecture. So for him, now classicism, classical style was pagan and decadent while Gothic is you know, Christian and spiritual. So um, for the first time, um, the uh, taste was start to be kind of reversed um, for the first time since the Renaissance. <clears throat> so his drawings um, often features these Gothic features, right? Those tall bell towers and uh, <clears throat> featuring those great um, kind of skeleton structures uh, characteristic for Gothic architecture. <clears throat> there were, um, you know, buildings designed by Pujin, um, like the uh, St. Gales. Um, he promote certain style and a certain taste so Pujin also idealized the Gothic uh, in, the, <clears throat> in a new light. So revival is never a pure revival. It is always combined with a contemporary um, spirit. For Pujin, Gothic architecture <clears throat> represent the <clears throat> integrated harmonious coexistence between church and the community. So that's one thing. Um, <clears throat> so it's not separate. So there was a social um, task shouldered by the new architectural revival. Uh, Industrial revolution created that um, split, you know, between the super rich and the super poor. Now, Gothic revival was meant to, to create a new harmony. <clears throat> and in terms of architecture, architectural style, he uh, specifically um, promote the polychromic um, masonry. Uh, Gothic architecture, unlike the kind of pure white classical, is colorful and those color are not artificial. So, and they were achieved by, by handicrafts, um, handicrafts, and those colors do not fade because they were the original color of, of ceramic tile or different color of stone or bricks. So those um, polychromic color was brought back to architecture, uh, which was somehow neglected um, in since the Renaissance. And uh, 18th century classicism also 
celebrate the pure white marble um, as a symbol of democracy and it didn't use much color. Um, so for example, the, you know, the Capitol building in Washington DC is white, right? It's pure white <clears throat> representing that 18th century um, kind of neoclassicism. Now color was brought back and he used a lot of color in his, in his building. Uh, <clears throat> so that is called the polychromic masonry. And um, the movement triggered by Pujin and by um, his followers like William Butterfield who designed the All uh, St. Um, Margaret Street uh, Church. Um, it's characterized by such a polychromic masonry. So it's, the surface is, is colorful. Okay? Use different color brick to make patterns. Um, and uh, this uh, eventually uh, would become known as the Victorian Gothic because it was it coincided with the long reign of Queen Victoria. Uh, <clears throat> so the church was built, you know, also shouldered the social uh, mission to create harmony in society. It was built in and for a poor district. And it was meant to incorporate uh, working class into the church to draw the, the mass, draw the poor to, to the religion, to kind of seal um, the, uh, the chism of the society between you know, the capitalist and the new pro uh, proletarian created by industrialization. And uh, <clears throat> A contemporary theorist um, and architectural thinker, uh, John Ruskin, also promoted um, kind of a medievalism, also promoted medieval society as the ideal for architecture um, and architecture as a inseparable uh, element of society. And he especially promote the kind of a honesty in, in material. He uh, delineated, you know, what is truthful in architecture. You know, we, we saw something like this in uh, Loger's writing, uh, Loger's writing in the in the in the 18th century. But Ruskin uh, expressed that more clearly. He talked about that for true architecture, um, there shouldn't be fake color. Uh, you know, painting on the surface of marble is wrong. Uh, if you want color in architecture, you, you, you need to be honest. You use to you choose different color of material. So those natural color of building material was emphasized in Ruskin's uh, <clears throat> writing. And Pujin certainly, um, you know, supported that. And uh, that is also reflected in the buildings by Pujin and uh, also Butterfield. So here, those patterns were permanent. Um, they do not fade because they were the honest natural color of the building material. However, <clears throat> the you know one would never mistake a 19th century uh, Victorian Gothic uh, with a 14th century or 15th century Gothic in England because they use the new material, new industrial material of cast iron, right? So Butterfield, for example, used cast iron column. And uh, those cast iron, to some extent, was perfect for Gothic revival because they were skinny, they were thin, and they were good at creating those vertical spires. Uh, so those were metal. Those columns, were instead of using stone, they were metal. And they were constructed, of course, much, much faster than those true Gothic cathedral, which often you know, took centuries to, to, to build. So they do use the new industrial material and um, for the Gothic uh, revival. And this kind of neo-Gothic is very influential in um, Anglo-Saxon countries uh, from United States to Australia to New Zealand. Um, so, um, in the United States, the Old South Church, 
know, very close. Um, so you can, you should just walk, you know, take a walk to that church and, and look at its exterior and, and interior. So this is a um, kind of a Victorian Gothic uh, in America, in, in Boston, uh, right? Uh, in your neighborhood. It's polychromic, it's colorful, both interior and exterior. It has colorful patterns on the wall using, using bricks and it adopted the Northern Italian Gothic style, right? Those spires and pointed arches and polychromic uh, <clears throat> arches in the interior as well. This is, yeah, this is the interior. So um, the um, kind of a Gothic revival uh, in Boston. <clears throat> Now that's one element. Um, another direction is historicism. So on one hand, there was some kind of new appearance of new theorization about architecture. On the other hand, historical style were still pretty much um, celebrated and adopted as the true architectural style right? in the 19th century. <clears throat> So there were all kinds of revivalism. <clears throat> and uh, Gideon, um, a famous 20th century architectural historian, had a th the following critique of revivalism. He said that in every new field in the 19th century, uh, cloaked each new invention with his his historicizing mask, new construction, new constructional possibilities were created but at the same time, they were feared. Each was senselessly buried beneath stone stage set. He was talking about the um, struggle between architecture and engineering, right? So that those new possibility, new material were used, but at the same time feared uh, in architecture as if they were ugly, they were wrong, they were destroying the beauty of architecture. So they were carefully masked behind those stone veneer or were shaped into those traditional motif. So there was a historicism predominant, predominating in the 19th century. Um, but the 19th century historicism um, is different from the previous century in that it acknowledged that a different age had a different style. It had a sense of evolving, development, progress, and that is very conscious in the, uh, in the 19th century because of the development of history as a discipline. So through history, people learned that a different age had a different character and uh, um, through the study of archaeological study of architecture, they realized that architecture had a different style in different country and in different period. And a consciousness was formed that different period had their unique architectural style that express the time spirit of their, their, their period. All right. So there is a the, um, in the German um, art historian's term that's called Zeitgeist, uh, that is time spirit, the concept of time spirit, each spirit, each time had, a, had a, its own spirit. So this kind of historicism created a new kind of revival and a new kind of historicism in architecture. I classify it into three. Um, so there are three aspects that differentiate the 19th century historicism from the previous classicism and re revival. One is eclecticism. Eclecticism <clears throat> is a kind of tolerating attitude uh, that one, uh, that believe one could choose any historical style. So unlike the 18th century who believe that, you know, <clears throat> there was a true architectural style, which is, you know, classical. Um, and um, so instead of pinning down a truthful style, uh, eclecticism, uh, eclecticism believe 
they, they are equally valid. So there is a relativist <clears throat> attitude in that consciousness about style. So they were all valid. The question is what to choose for which kind of building. So you might choose, choose a different style of building for different purposes. So instead of mastering one style, architect were encouraged to learn all style. And uh, they had a kind of a toolbox to choose from. That is eclecticism, right? And they also uh, might combine a style of different period and different ethnic origin uh, in the same building to create a, a hybrid that is also eclecticism. And that is something new. And the second is revivalism. Um, for revivalism, one is to choose the one true historical style to convey the unique spirit of the nation. So revivalism is often associated with nationalism. So a, a rising nation might consider a specific style as representing the national spirit. And those national projects uh, would be constructed in that revival style because it was meant to express that unique spirit of the nation. And the third is avant-gardism. In historicism, I mentioned it has a belief that each age had its own spirit. Then the question is, what about contemporary? What, what about the very age we are living in, in the 19th century, right? So if 18th century has its style, its spirit, 15th century has its style, its spirit, then what about the 19th century? So it must, <clears throat> it need its own style to express the spirit of the age of contemporary, no matter, you know, what do you mean by contemporary? In 19th century, that is 19th century. In the 20th century, that is 20th century. And now 21st century, we have the same question. And that concept is avant-gardism, which means, basically means pioneer. You know, you have something, you are looking for the spirit of our age, which is probably is not existing yet, but you are finding. And to some extent, you are looking for something that is for the future. Uh, on one hand, it is meant to express our age. On the other hand, it is not existing. You are creating. And uh, it is, if it is representing our current age, then eventually it is going to be mainstream. And uh, hopefully in the future, um, future generation will follow and um, um, make it the spirit of our age. But at the time of its creation, it is still in the search. It is not existing yet. That is the very spirit of avant-garde, pioneer. Right? So such consciousness is only possible with a historicism that is connected with progress, with development, and with evolving. So all these com complicated issues are hidden behind the seemingly conservative facade of 19th century architecture. So in terms of eclecticism, <clears throat> one were able to choose different style. So, um, so 19th century thus had a lot of architectural terms. Uh, so you might have heard the empire style. What is empire style? Empire style is one of the eclecticism referring to the court style of Napoleon's, you know, imperial court, um, Napoleon III, especially. Following um, Napoleon the Great's military and scientific expedition to Egypt in 1798, um, you know, he brought back a lot of artifacts from Egypt to um, to France, as well as you know, other part of the world. And um, so it triggered a creation of a new style incorporating ancient cultures, ancient architectural 
and artistic styles in the creation of the court art and architecture. So there was some kind of ancient Egyptian revival that is part of the empire style and which is part of the eclecticism, right? So understanding that characterization, you won't be confused by all those isms um, in the uh, historical writing in 19th century. So um, eclecticism adopt Egyptian architecture for certain type of buildings to express death and eternity. Uh, for example, they use Egyptian style to build um, the house of detention, to build a, um, to build a prison, to build a cemetery, and uh, to build you know the the gate of of a cemetery in London is built in Egyptian style using those Egyptian capitals, um, and sometimes the archaeological society also use Egyptian style like the, that skull and bone secret society at uh, uh, Yale uh, University um, built this pilo, um, pylon like entrance. Right? So these are eclecticism. <clears throat> and with the uh, expansion of the British Empire, uh, colonialism also contributed to eclecticism, not only um, ancient world, but also the Oriental architectural detail were uh, incorporated into these kind of uh, new buildings of the uh, 19th century. Um, like this Royal Pavilion, um, it's built, it's uh, constructed in uh, the Indian style, right? India um, became part of the British Empire. The interior were also, you know, furnished with those different um, different historical and uh, ethnic uh, styles. So <clears throat> um, colonialism, um, orientalism, that is also part of the kind of eclectical attitude to architecture. Um, and um, another element um, the Moorish, the so-called Moorish architecture. Moorish architecture referred to the Islamic uh, style architecture along the southern coast of Mediterranean. Uh, those in Egypt, in Morocco, uh, in Tunisia, um, you know, in th those, those countries, North African countries, um, or southern Spain, right? So they use a lot of polychromic masonry as well, just like medieval European architecture, a lot of colors using bricks and patterns. Uh, <clears throat> so they were also, um, they were related to the appreciation of the exotic, which uh, was heralded in the uh, picturesque of the 18th century, right? Those picturesque garden in England already uh, started this, this kind of, a, uh, this, this kind of, you know, fashion in architecture. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and of course, there were also um, revivalist architecture that apply a style more consistently. Greek revival was still pretty, pretty popular, uh, especially in architecture expressing certain kind of ideal um, for example, the British Museum was constructed in the Greek Revival style. Right? It's used um, consistently the Ionic order for the construction of the entrance uh, and also the uh, colonnade uh, surrounding the symmetrical building. Um, same is true also for um, the MFA um, that just across the street from the campus. So these, those are classical revival building um, from the <clears throat> 19th century. So Greek revival <clears throat> was very powerful. It continued from the 18th century to the 19th century because of the struggle of Greece uh, for its independence from the Ottoman uh, Empire. 
So um, not only in England, but also in Germany that you know, Greek revival buildings were, were constructed. And uh, uh, for example, the uh, Wahala in Germany um, constructed as a hall of fame, honoring outstanding personalities of the German towns. Um, those great um, novelists, great um, literature and uh, famous writers, um, poet, were celebrated uh, in, a, uh, in a kind of a new Parthenon um, on a new Acropolis. So this is a um, Greek revival architecture in Germany and uh, uh, in, in, in uh, support and a celebration of the Greek independence. Greece eventually uh, achieved its independence in 1832. It's, the building was constructed uh, right at that moment in Germany. Um, so 19th century was complicated because, uh, precisely because there were multi-direction in architectural preference. There were struggles, there were debate, and uh, there were different, um, different options uh, and different choice made by the architect. So another great movement um, in art and architecture in the 19th century was the Romanticism. While those classical revival revived Greco-Roman architecture, uh, Romanticism in architecture um, and art celebrate uh, medievalism. And uh, it is kind of a overlap a lot with Gothic revival. Uh, <clears throat> Romanticism, the origin, just like classicism, can also be found in the 18th century. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau celebrating nature, celebrating personality, ce celebrating emotion already started this kind of beginning of romantic movement. Um, he said, I'm not made like anyone I have seen. I dare believe that I'm not made like anyone in existence. If I'm not superior, at least I am different. The celebration of uniqueness, difference, is a key char characteristic of, uh, uh, of, of romanticism. Uh, kind of celebrating the, the subject um, or the subjective uh, instead of those kind of classical standardization. <clears throat> so, um, so romanticism can be considered as a rejection of the precepts of order, calm, harmony, balance, idealization, rationality typified by classicism so it emphasized the opposite, that is the individual, the subjective, the irrational, the imaginative, the personal, the spontaneous, the emotional, and the visionary. So um, some concept that we introduced in the 18th century continued in the romantic movement in the 19th century, like appreciation of the beauty of nature that started with the um, picturesque as well. And also um, personality, um, a preoccupation with the genius. You know, genius was to some extent against classical because classical uh, is measurable, right? Those classical church had an ideal proportion, had all kinds of principle and rules. If you follow, you create something beautiful, but a genius, is individual. Um, genius is not learnable. You cannot learn to be a genius. It was born, right? So celebration of genius and focus on passion and inner struggle. And uh, uh, there is also a obsessive interest in folk culture, uh, in the ethnic culture, the national difference, and also um, the medieval era. Uh, idealized and romanticized as something, uh, you know, mysterious 
unknowable, but at the same time, um, kind of a, you know, I won't say beautiful, but something that is, that is, that is good, right? That is good, uh, sublime. So um, nationalism was combined with revivalism and especially Gothic revival because a lot of nations trace their national origin to the medieval time. You know, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, that paved the ground zero for the development of ethnic nationality, ethnic identity. And they were combined with a narrative. And um, so history writing would trace certain uh, ethnic and the national origin to different um, ethnic groups in the medieval time. Uh, uh, th those, including those Germanic um, uh, people that invade and collapsed the Roman Empire. Uh, the the Anglo-Saxon, uh, for example, uh, the uh, the Franks uh, for the for French, and the the, the Slavic people. Um, so the, they trace their origin to those medieval times. And interestingly, they would use Gothic um, to represent the, uh, the, the kind of nationalism. For example, the Hungarian parliament was constructed in the kind of Gothic revival style. Uh, details are Gothic um, and the facade has the image of Gothic church, but that enormous, enormous uh, prominent dome is a legacy of the Renaissance, obviously. So no Gothic period in me medieval time would have a uh, prominent dome like that. So um, it is selective. It is very selective. It is artificial. And uh, it require just as much forgetting, uh, forgetting as remembering, uh, as the comments uh, Amist Renan said, forgetting I would even go so far as to say historical era is a crucial factor in the creation of a nation. Thus, the progress of historical studies is often a danger for national identity because the deeper you dig, the more you, you deconstruct the myth of national identity. Um, it is a myth. It is a modern myth, uh, national identity. So, quote, the, the essence of a nation is that all individuals have many things in common and also that they have forgotten many things. That is crucial for the creation of national identity. Um, <clears throat> thus, Benedict uh, Anderson said, um, nationalism appears new to historians and ancient to lay people because historians knows it didn't exist. But for lay people, they thought nationalism is old. It's always, always there. Um, so Germany, for example, claimed this Gothic as their national uh, style as well. The famous poet um, from the 18th century uh, Goethe commented on the Strasbourg Cathedral, said, with what unlocked for emotions did the sight surprise me when I stepped before it, a sensation of wholeness, greatness filled my soul, which composed of a thousand harmonizing details I could savor and enjoy, yet by no means understand or explain. This is German architecture, this is ours, when the Italian can boast none of this and even less the Frenchman, right? So he is emphasizing this is unique. This is just German, right? This is German. And, uh, you know, for us who has been studying architectural history, we know how absurd that is. You know, who can claim this as pure German and uh, nothing, no other can claim it. Not Italian, not Frenchman. You know, you ask really. Uh, um, 
So, but, you know, even though it was written in the 18th century, um, Goethe expressed the typical um, kind of tone of the 19th century uh, romanticism. He highlights sensation, he highlights something that cannot be understood, um, but, but it is sensational, all right? So um, this, this is not classical, right? Classical want you to understand want you to use your rational thinking. But now this kind of romantic uh, attitude combined with Gothic revival, combined with nationalism and created architecture that were celebrated as you know, pure German. But we know that Strasbourg, it, that at the border um, uh, of today's Germany and uh, France, and actually today, you know, it belonged to France. Uh, so, um, and it was, it became under French sovereignty, uh, you know, after the, the uh, Napoleon War and after the Second World War as well. So um, when that cathedral does not belong to Germany anymore, Cologne Cathedral was constructed to embody the German nationalism and the Cologne Cathedral was constructed in the Gothic revival style. And uh, its construction um, was uh, only recently completed, completed right? And um, so Gothic, revi uh, Gothic revival church uh, that was used to express German national identity. Um, and uh, it is a kind of very um, typical 19th century phenomena uh, associated with the Gothic revival. Um, and from this background, we um, might take a look at the career of Karl Friedrich uh, Schinko. Uh, Friedrich Schinko um, it all started with this kind of Gothic revival. So he designed building like that, Gothic revival. Um, which was considered the representing the um, German nationalism. But his most famous building is the Alti Museum, the old museum in Berlin. And it is constructed uh, in the classical revival style. Uh, so it also reflects the 19th century, um, the eclecticism. So the same architect was capable of doing different style and the would choose different style to design different building. So for a museum, he felt using classical style is most um, appropriate. Um, and uh, it is constructed uh, using um, ionic colonnade for the entrance. And uh, the center, he built a uh, pantheon. So this is the facade, looks kind of pretty much like um, the, um, the Hellenistic uh, uh, altar. And uh, <clears throat> indeed, um, the Alti Museum, Alti Museum defined what museum should look like, right? Museum like train station had no precedence. There was no previously constructed building just for the purpose of sheltering artifact. Um, this is the, the first one. Previous ones like the Palace Museum in Beijing or the Louvre, um, they were imperial or royal palaces. They were not built as a museum. Uh, it is only kind of a transformed into, into a museum. Uh, so to some extent, the British Museum, the Arti Museum in Germany, these are the early museums and they use classical uh, revival style. And um, they use the sacred architecture from the classical time. And indeed, today museum is like a modern temple. We go to a museum pretty much like the um, ancient people went to, uh, went to a temple. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Shinko directly uh, connect religion and art. Uh, he said religion and art stand side by side like two kindred spirits. Um, and the museum is the modern counterpart to the ancient 
temple. So they, uh, he kind of divided it um, by the central pantheon and the central pantheon. Um, so a great staircase, you know, leading, give you a sense of ascending, um, a kind of a ritualistic sense of moving up, appreciating, worshiping, looking at those artifacts, almost like worshiping uh, the icon um, from, uh, from antiquity. And um, this is the ceiling. So obviously this is a 19th century version of the, of the Pantheon. And uh, Gothic revival in England, the famous example is the, um, is the, the, uh, the House of uh, Parliament completed in 1836 using Gothic details, spires and the Big Ben uh, bell tower. So all those looks Gothic. However, um, if you look at the plan, there's nothing Gothic about it, right? So it's just a Gothic clove. The complicated modern functionality um, create this very complicated interior. And you don't see a basilica, you don't see aisle, you don't see apse. It's just um, a, a very practical building. So Gothic revival, just like any other revival in the 19th century is pretty much just concerning about the surface, the decoration. It is a style. And now the style has nothing to do with the function, has nothing to do with the interior, has nothing to do with space. It is just a cloth. And this is another characteristic of 19th century architecture. While in the Renaissance, um, in you know, people were still debating about the Latin cross versus Greek cross, concentric versus basilica. It has something to do with the space and a ritual activity in the space as well. Now in the 19th century, style and a stylistic consideration became, you know, it, it kind of surfaced. It became on people's consciousness. And at the same time, it became to some extent superficial. Uh, it is an issue of style and style only. Uh, all right, I'm going to give you um, a five minutes break. And after that, we will continue. And uh, many would consider the following the beginning of modernism, right? Starting with William Morris. <clears throat> 